love to sing that. I never get tired of it. I never get tired of it. I, I tell this story a lot, so some of you have heard it a bunch, and I apologize, but I just remember being a kid, and we would sing that in the church I grew up in on Easter Sunday, and I just, I just loved it. I was just, I just excited on Easter Sunday to sing, He Lives, He Lives. And I remember thinking as a kid that if I were in charge, we would sing that every Sunday. <laughs> and we don't quite sing it every Sunday, but today we sang it twice if you were here at 9.15, but I, uh, I love that. That's good. And some of, those, some of those hymns, some of those just principles, they just get uh, more precious the longer you uh, walk the Lord. I, the resurrection is not something that I have ever gotten over. Uh, and at my lowest points, um, the foundation that's underneath that is that he lives. No matter how bad things may seem to be, and sometimes th- things can seem pretty bad, but there's still an empty tomb in Jerusalem. It's still empty. Every year, it's the only grave people visit because of who is not buried there. <laughs> and I thought it was an appropriate song to sing this morning uh, as we look at these uh, next five verses in Genesis chapter 1. It's our third message in the series. The title of it is Life. Now, what, what a great song to sing as we consider the idea of life. The fact that we serve a living God, the living God. Jesus lives. And so this morning we're going to be looking at this idea of life, and uh, I've got a lot to cover this morning, and um, some of you have been uh, very encouraging about this series, and I I appreciate that. Um, So we're continuing on with the nerdiness um, as we go through it. some, Some of you that are against it need to speak up a little bit louder because I've been hearing from all the people that love the nerdiness. They've been coming up to me. They're kind of egging me on a little bit, but uh, we're still going to try to keep it in sort of con- Sunday morning sort of context. But like we always do, we want to look at the text first, make sure that we've understood the context of it and uh, really kind of soak in just the text first. And then we'll get the idea of secure, safe, and sound uh, as we make application of it together this morning. But Genesis chapter 1, you've already stood for the reading of it, so I won't ask you to stand again. But look at these verses with me again, if you would. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. I want to read it, and then we'll pray. Verse 20, And God said, I want to just note here again how marvelous it is that out of all the ways God could have chosen to create things, he could have fought it, he could have used his hands or or something, he could have done anything, but he chose to create. His creative act is by speaking. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things, and Jesus, of course, one of his names is the Word. So when we see here that God said, you can look at that and just read Jesus, amen? Isn't that wonderful? And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. We are here now on the fifth day of creation, and God is going to create something that's brand new. He's made the stars and the planets and the moon. He's created the waters. He's created the dry land, the whole earth, the grass and the plants. But now there's something new, something that hath life. I so appreciate what uh, Deacon Scott, he was the right person. You know, there's just a rotation that we go through, but he was the right guy for the scripture reading this morning. I I sure appreciate what he said about that. I was just thinking, Brother Scott, as you were talking about just the way the Lord communicates love to us uh, through these animals, sometimes even before we know him. And... uh, Mine was a Rottweiler named Margie. And I don't know if I'd have survived my teenage years without Margie. (laughs) Man, it's incredible how some of these animals can just uh, be so close uh, into your heart. But it's because there's something special about them. They are creatures that have life. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that means, but life is incredibly special. Wherever you find it, life is incredibly special. Every teenager ought to have a dog. I just believe that. It's it's like, it's almost cruelty to make a teenager not have some kind of an animal. Okay. (laughs) What am I doing? Back on target. Every moving creature that hath life and the fowl that fly uh, above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great whales and every living creature that moveth 
which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture, for the chance to be together with your people in your house and to spend these next few moments together to really spend some concentrated time looking at your word. God, thank you for giving us your word. That we don't have to wonder about what you're like, that we don't have to guess, that we don't have to rely on other people's opinions. But God, you have spoken and written it down for us. That whether we're having a good day or a bad day, no matter how our emotions or our feelings are doing, no matter what's popular or unpopular in culture and society, that your word is always the same. God, what a sure foundation you've given us. We are so grateful that we do not have to base our lives on somebody's opinion, but that we have your word. God, this morning I pray that you'd help us to take it seriously, that we would be genuinely engaged with you and your word, Lord, that, but that today would not be simply an intellectual exercise, but that you would grab us by the heart. God, if we need a shake, that you would give it to us. Lord, that we might not just learn things today, but that we would be changed people. This is entirely beyond my ability to do. Lord, you know I always feel so terribly short to stand behind this pulpit. But these are your people, God. They've come to hear from you and from your word, and we have it, and we're going to preach it. Lord, please, I have an outline. I have things prepared. But we don't want just to go by the outline. We want it to go by what you have planned to say to your people. Lord, we just turn it all over to you now. We want you to do whatever you want for your people. Help us to be available for you to use. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to look at these um, six or so verses here together this morning. Uh, as we do it, we'll just kind of take it line by line. I'll offer some thoughts um, as, we, as we look at it. Once we've gotten the whole sense of the text here together this morning, then we'll make some application into this idea of secure, safe, and sound, which is the theme of this series. Let's start with verse 20, and we'll look here at day five, life in the sea and in the air. Life in the sea, and in the air. We just read those verses together that God made the moving creatures that hath life, the birds to fly in the air, and the whales and the living creatures, the fish, to live uh, in the sea. Now, this phrase, that hath life, is enormously interesting. Uh, If you'll look at it in in the Hebrew, um, it's it's literally, and and my Hebrew is not very good, it's nefesh kehei, and some of you could probably straighten me out on that, the nefesh kehei, and it means that hath life. And, and when we see this phrase, it's, if you understand the way that it's used and just what these words in the Hebrew mean, it means living, breathing soul and life. Sometimes people will talk about, well, do animals have souls or not? And the answer, biblically, may I say to you this morning, is yes. Uh, the word here, nafish K, is the same word that when God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul. It's the same words. And so that's the reason why animals, why we're able to have, I mean, animals, they, they display all the characteristics of a soul, amen? They, they have emotions and feelings and they respond. They, uh, I've had, I had a dog that was depressed occasionally, amen? <laughs> And, uh, and, but that's part of the reason they're so special. They're different than plants. And, and this is why. The Bible, now, it, it, you look at any biology textbook, and they, they, scientists are at a loss to define what it means to be alive. It's really, a, when you think about something that is so central as Life. I mean, we haven't even gotten to what's the meaning of life yet. Just what does it mean to be alive? And they can't even define it. But yet you recognize it when you see it, don't you? And no one's ever been concerned that that apple's alive and I'm eating it alive. (laughs) Unless something's real broken. (laughs) Right? But life is this incredible thing. It's a gift directly from God. I actually have this video. It's two minutes and 30 seconds long. I don't show a lot of videos, but this one really does a great job of sort of outlining it. So we're going to dim the lights here on the, on the platform just a little bit. It's only two, two and a half minutes long. I, wanna, I want you to watch this, and then we'll keep talking about life.
On the fifth day of creation, after God spangled the universe with planets, stars, and galaxies, he introduced something completely new into creation. Life. The Bible describes a whole range of things as living, from birds to cattle, from fish to humans, even God himself. Since God is a spirit and alive, this is a clue that life is not physical, but the Bible doesn't actually define what life is. When science textbooks try to define life, they describe DNA, or cells, or chemical reactions. Biology textbooks end up describing what living things are made of, and what living things do. They do not actually define life itself. What happens, for example, when an animal dies? DNA and cells are still in place, but life is missing. Life can't be weighed or measured. It seems to be beyond the tools of science. The non-physical nature of life may explain why biologists are so unsure about which things are alive. In fact, their list of living things does not entirely match the Bible's list. The Bible, for example, never describes plants as living. Instead, it calls them green things. The word living does not appear in the Bible until God made the animals of the sea two days after he created plants. The marvelous animals of the air, sea, and land are all described as living things. Where did this mysterious life come from? We can't even restore life to an animal that has died, let alone create life from scratch. The Bible tells us that life is a gift of God. The abundance of living things all around us is a daily reminder of our living God, who is the source of all life. I don't know if you've ever really given much thought to what it means to be alive or what it is. It, it can't be weighed and measured. It's something that happens beyond biology even. And so it's this incredible thing to think about. And here we have it on day five where God creates it for the first time. God, who is the living God, who has life, has now given life to some of his creation. This is really, really a, a marvelous thought, and we can't develop it as fully. I don't have the time this morning as I'd like to, but I highlight Acts 17, 24. This was our theme verse for our vacation Bible school this year. Uh, you have just an excerpt of it there in your outline. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he's Lord of heaven and earth, he dwells not in temples made with hands, neither does he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life, breath, and all things. Anywhere you find life, you have found the gift of the living God. What an incredible thing, God's creation of life. All right, let's keep going on with our text here, verse 21. The other thing that you'll find this phrase repeated over and over and over again, we see this, that half life, that half life. The other phrase that's repeated regularly here is after their kind. You see it first there in verse 21. God created the great whales and every living creature that moveth and the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. What does it mean after their kind? Well, I would suggest to you this morning that this is simply a scientific fact of everything we have ever observed is that when creatures of any living kind, as they reproduce, they always produce after their kind. When, if you have a dog that gets pregnant, nobody is on pins and needles wondering if you're getting puppies or kittens. Maybe we'll have a cow. <laughs> we know that dogs, when they have babies, always have more dogs. Now, some of the dogs are bigger, or some of them are smaller, and some of them are longer or shorter or fuzzier or less fuzzy, right? You get all kinds of variation, but guess what you always get? A dog, right? And, and all living things do this. And, and through... Um, through selective breeding and stuff like that, you know, God did not make chihuahuas. I was expecting somebody to be unhappy about that. <laughs> no, God, God made dogs and dogs reproduced after their kind until eventually somebody in California thought it would be a good idea 
to just kind of keep breeding for, all right, I'm going to quit making fun of chihuahuas before I get in trouble. The, the point is, though, that you get all kinds of variations within a kind. Everybody knows that that's true, but you don't get creatures that change kinds. That's just a Bible truth. And so what, what that's relevant for as we think about this is the idea of evolution's tree versus creation's orchard. If you could understand for just a moment the idea, one of the central ideas of Darwinian evolution, of the evolution that's taught to every kid in, in, in school, in public school in America today, is that we started with a, a, with a living thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and that that living thing got more and more complex and then eventually it started to differentiate out into different kinds of living things. And those different kinds of living things became other kinds of living things. And that every living thing you see all came from an original living thing. That's the idea behind evolution. It's like a tree. You start down here and then it starts branching off in different directions. And that's how it goes. The idea that's presented to us in the Bible is not that way at all. It's more like an orchard. You've got an original living thing, and then it starts to get a little bit different. You get different kinds of dogs, different kinds of cats, different kinds of fish, but they all stay within their tree. Now, this is what's taught. The tree is what's taught as scientific fact today. The orchard is what the Bible says. But which one do we actually observe happening? <laughs> The orchard is the only thing we ever see. It is never, not one time ever, been observed we can take one kind of creature and turn it into another kind of creature. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, part of the reason we struggle with this is because there's been a very tricky thing done, and that is that the word evolution is used to mean two different things. And so if you don't believe in evolution, you're called anti-science or, you know, just whatever, you know, you probably believe the earth is flat or whatever sort of terrible things, nasty name calling they want to do. But the fact is, is that they use the same word evolution to mean two different things. And one thing everybody believes in, every reasonable person believes in, if we could call it little e evolution. And little e evolution is small changes over time. Every rational person believes in that. We observe it all the time. That's how we breed different kinds of dogs. That's how we get different kinds of apples, right? We, 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 we select for the bigger or the redder or whatever we want, and then we just kind of keep breeding like that until we get, we, over a series of small changes, you get to the end result that you want. And they say, well, look, it's evolution. You can see it. And if you go look at any evolution textbook, they will give you all kinds of examples like this about goldfinch beaks changing or things like that, or the moths, the dark moths versus the light moths, and then, you know, the changes and they get wiped out and, you know, all this sort of thing. But all those are examples. Guess what? The finches with the big beaks and the finches with small beaks are both, guess what? They're still finches. And not only finches, but birds. Okay. Right? Which is a really different thing than the other way that evolution gets used, big E, if you will, evolution, which is the idea that life can add genetic information over time. Because if you're going to start out with an amoeba and you're going to get a fish, you're going to need some new information, like how to build fins how to get gills and breathe oxygen and all those sorts of things that amoebas don't do, right? You need new information. If you're going to go from a fish to a monkey, you're going to need new information. And to go from a monkey to a person, you're going to need new information, right? Now, the idea is that genetic mutations are going to be adding this new information. Do you know how often we observe genetic mutations add information to the DNA or to the genome? What do you want to guess? How often? Never! They have been trying in labs to do this for literally decades under ideal conditions, stacking the deck, trying to make it happen. Never, not one time, never, never in nature, never in the lab, never, even with brilliant PhD scientists trying to make it happen, have we ever observed a genetic mutation that could add information? Not once. Guess what happens every single time? You lose it. It always goes backwards. Those dogs, like you can take a wolf and you can, if you put enough time in, get all the way down to a chihuahua. Okay, you can. Guess what you can't do? You can't go from a chihuahua back up to a wolf. Now, the chihuahua might be better for certain circumstances, but it has less genetic information than the wolf does. So we've changed it over time, we've modified it, 
but it's gotten less information, not more. Same thing with the apples. You can take wild apples and you can breed wild apples and cultivate them until you can get to a golden delicious, if you wonder, a Granny Smith, but you can't get from the Granny Smith back to the wild apple. Why? The wild apple's got more genetic information in it than the Granny Smith does. Now, the Granny Smith might be tastier, but it's less complex. What does that tell us? That tells us that everything we have ever observed not only reinforces the creation's orchard idea over evolution's tree idea, that everything does repeat after its kind, but not only that, but it's going backwards for what you need for evolution. Don't believe me. Go look it up. I dare you. Go read about it. Okay. Verse 22 and 23. God said to the animals, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Let's look at it there together. Verse 22, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters and the seas, let the fowls multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. God gave animals this instruction, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. The animals have done this. Unlike people, when God told them to scatter, people said, no, let's get together and build a tower. But when God told the animals to scatter, be multiply, multiply and fill the earth. They did it. You can go to the most inhospitable desert in the world and guess what you will find? Living creatures. There are deserts in the world where it only rains once every four or five years. And when it rains, there are living things that have been hibernating in the sand that will spring to life, will swim around and do their stuff. And then when the water dries up, they go back into hibernation. I mean, that's bananas. They find volcanoes with living things inside of them. Volcanoes. Why? Because God said, fill it up. And so they did. <laughs> and then verses 24 and 25, we find that God's going to make land. Uh, on day six, he's going to make life on the land. Now he's made it in the air and in the seas and now on the land. We're stopping short of the creation of Adam and Eve here this morning. We're just going to talk about living things in general. Uh, verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, next Sunday, Pastor Farouk is preaching. We're super excited about that. And then after that, we're going to talk about Adam and Eve. But this morning, we want to talk about just life um, in general. And so we're, God is now here on day five and six made life. Life in the sea, life in the air, and life on land. As we make application of that this morning, our theme of this series is secure, safe, and sound. And so as we pivot to that, I have to do this very briefly for the sake of time this morning. Uh, if you've missed it, the fuller introduction was in the first message. It's available online. You can get the audio or the video there. I'm going to do this quickly. The thought about secure, safe, and sound, the reason for this series when God put the burden on my heart to preach back through Genesis, it had been four years or so since we preached through Genesis, it was this idea right here. If we let the cold, if we let the cold air inside the warmth of the cabin, where can those who are freezing outside go if they want to get warm? There's a great contrast between the cold that's outside and the heat that's inside. And if we let the cold inside, it'll be less of a shock to come inside. It'll be less of a dramatic change. If we would open the windows and doors of the cabin and let the cold air in, it wouldn't be nearly so hard to go from the cold into the warmth. It'd be much easier, be much more natural. But where can the freezing go? if we let all the heat out. And of course, we're not just talking about temperature this morning. The idea of secure, safe, and sound is this. If we change the truth of the scriptures to be more comfortable to the lost, less of a shock in how different the truth is than the, that the Bible is than everything else, where can the lost go when their burdens are finally too heavy to bear? If they can't come and find relief at the church, where are they going to get relief? I understand, Christian, that it is increasingly difficult to be a Bible believer. That we are increasingly scorned. That we are increasingly called names like bigot and hateful. Because we say we believe this book, 
But I'm telling you, if we open the windows and we let the air in, if we decide to become more like the world so that they will hate us less, when they are finally freezing to death and ready to get warm, where will they go? If we're just like them, if we don't believe anything different. Sin hurts. It always kills, even when you like it and are attached to it. All right. So in service of Secure, Safe, and Sound, we're asking three questions each week as we look at the Genesis. First question about Secure is, is it really true? Is it really true? We're going to ask those questions and answer them. Then we're going to ask about, is it safe to believe this? We believe this, what traps of the enemy will it help us avoid? And sound, can we really build our lives on what's here? Is it really sound? Is this a solid foundation on which we can build our lives? Yes or no? So we're going to be doing that as we go through. Okay, let's make application here out of, our, out of our text this morning on the idea of life. We'll start with secure. Is it really true? Is it really true that God made life or is life an incredibly lucky chemistry accident that, that there were just a whole bunch of chemicals stirring around in a big soup and then eventually life. You can't believe both. Either God made it or it's an accident. Which one is it? The Bible clearly says that life is a gift of God, that he created it, that he imparted it to the first living things. Is that really true? I want to suggest to you this morning that it is. Nobody's shocked, okay? <laughs> but I want to talk about three pieces of evidence this morning that it's really true. The first one we want to talk about a little bit this morning is the miracle of DNA. Everyone heard of DNA? Okay, um, we, we deal a lot with this just in my family. Uh, you know, my daughter Evangeline um, has a genetic deletion. And so we got a geneticist that's on our, on our team and we've had to deal with a, a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, DNA is so fascinating. I love it. I'm gonna try to control myself a little bit this morning as we talk about the miracle of DNA. So DNA, if you don't know, stands for deoxy, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. That's what DNA stands for. And here's the key thing this morning. It is an information system. More than a biological system, more than a physical system, DNA is an information system. And once you understand that, and I'm going to prove to you that that's true, but once you understand that that's true, it, it's a miracle. You cannot explain DNA without an intelligence. Without a creator God, there is no DNA. Let me... Let's talk about why. So how many of you are familiar with Morse code? Not do it, but know what it is. Okay, you all know what Morse code is. So Morse code is, is just that. It's a code, and it's based on three uh, characters, a dot, a dash, and a space, right? That's, that's what Morse code is. By putting those dots and dashes and spaces together in different orders, you can create up to 26 letters. You can do more than that, but Morse code's in English, right? That's what it's for. So you can create all 26 letters of the English language by combining dots, dashes, and spaces in different orders. Everybody with me so far? From those 26 letters, you can build the 400,000 or so words in the English language, right? Y'all know you can use letters to make words? Yeah, yeah. It's going to get worse from here, people. You've got to hang with me just a little bit. I, it's your fault. You've been encouraging me to be nerdy. Um, from those 400,000 words, you can make an infinite number of sentences. There is no hard limit on how many different kinds of sentences you can make. You can make sentences that have never been thought of, spoken, or written down ever before in the history of humanity. You could make a brand new one today. That's kind of fun, right? What a cool, from just 26 letters, from just 400,000 words, you can make a literally infinite number of sentences. That's pretty cool. DNA works the same way, except instead of just three symbols, DNA is built on four nucleotides, G, T, C, and A. From those nucleotides, you can make 20 different proteins. From those 20, or 20 amino acids, from those 20 amino acids, we know that life can build 100,000 different proteins. Now, those proteins are the building blocks of every tissue, uh, and they're different ones. Your eyes need different tissue than your feet do, right? Your liver needs different tissue than the heart does. They all require different sort of proteins, and there's 100,000 different kinds that you can build out of those 20 amino acids. Just like the letters can use the words, from those 100,000 proteins, you can put it together in basically an infinite number of combinations to make everything from birds to people to bugs to dogs. 
It's, it's an information system. It works just the same way any other code or information system works. Now, like an information system also, the other thing that's important that makes this an information system is that DNA actually isn't anything by itself. It's just the code. In order for it to be information, something has to be able to interpret the code. Y'all with me? Just finding a series of dots and dashes, you'd be like, boy, somebody spilled a bunch of periods and hyphens, right? Until somebody interprets it, it doesn't actually have any meaning yet. Y'all with me? In your body, DNA stores all the information, and RNA, ribonucleic acid, interprets it, and it interprets it and translates it into actually creating the protein. It's an information system. Listen, if you've got DNA, but no RNA, all you've got is a puddle of goo. And if you have RNA, but nothing for it to read, you've got less than goo. DNA without RNA is useless. RNA without DNA is useless. What's that mean? It means we're looking at an information system. You have to have both parts. There's no way to explain information without intelligence. Now, if we were walking along the beach and we found a bunch of rocks arranged in the pattern of a star, that'd be kind of amazing. But maybe, maybe that could happen by chance. How many of you, if you came across the beach and you found a perfectly formed star pattern on the beach made out of rocks, how many of you would go, wow, that's an accident? <laughs> Most of you would be looking around for the kid or kid at heart that did that, right? But maybe, maybe just a shape could be an accident. But if you were walking along the beach and you found this, help, written in the sand, how many of you think, isn't that amazing that the waves and the sticks and some birds just made this? No, you're a bad friend. Because this isn't, now these are symbols. These are symbols, but they're symbols that mean something. They're information. One of my favorite Far Side cartoons, I love the Far Side, is this one. Uh, the pilot's flying over the guy there, and the, and the pilot, I don't know if you can read it, but the pilot's saying, wait, wait, cancel that. I guess it just says health. <laughs> like, don't send the rescue for this guy. He doesn't need help. He's just asking for health. <laughs> right now, it's just because he's missing the, okay. <laughs> You're learning all kinds of things about your pastor through this series. This is my sense of humor right here. <laughs> because... It, if it's not interpreted, then it's not information. Everybody with, tracking with me so far? Okay. So, no matter how you look at it, you cannot explain information without intelligence. Now, sometimes, say help did get formed accidentally. Now, that's bananas. Let's say it happened, though. There it is in the sand, help, formed by sheer dumb accident. Now, that, you got to be kind of special to believe that's true. But, but it's say, let's just say for the sake of argument that it could happen, okay? It still is information because an information intelligence looked at it and interpreted it as information. So it's still intelligence has to be involved in information. It has to be involved, at least in the interpretation. But if it's going to be useful information, it has to be involved on both sides. And DNA is an incredibly complex information system. It's not just like a star or even just like help written in the sand. I mean, this is, again, I'm not going to walk you through this, relax. Um, but DNA is just crazy complicated. We are only now even beginning to unravel uh, the mysteries of how complex our DNA is. It is more complex than any computer chip ever made. Now, Nobody would look at a computer, especially like a supercomputer, and think, isn't that amazing that that earthquake and all these millions of years of erosion and just chemistry just produced this supercomputer, right? That'd be, that'd be insane. DNA is vastly more complicated than any supercomputer people have ever made. I want to tell you a little bit how much. If I had a pinhead, not shown actual size, if I had a pinhead of DNA, how much information could I store in it? I could make a stack of books that reached from the earth all the way to the moon 500 times. 
that many books of information in one pinhead of DNA. That's how much information it can store. That's inside every single living cell. DNA, my friends, is a miracle. And it's an information miracle. And there is never, never information without intelligence. So, guess what? Right inside of you and every living thing is proof that an intelligence was involved in making life. All right. Also, we have the fact of irreducible complexity this morning. The fact of irreducible complexity. Um, Seculars do not believe in this. If you get on the internet and type irreducible complexity, the first things that will come up is a whole bunch of people with PhDs telling you why you are stupid if you believe in irreducible complexity, which is why it sort of delights me to say that it's a fact. (laughs) Because it is. It's a fact. I I don't know how many PhDs you got to get before this is not obvious. But anyway, the simplest living cell is so complex and so overwhelmingly complicated, there is no possibility that it happened by chance. Evolution used to seem when Darwin and, and his guys, when they were putting the whole thing together, it seemed more plausible because at his day, they believed that the simplest living cells were little blobs of gel. The best microscopes in the world, all we could see was they're just little blobs of kind of nothing, and they thought that was what made up life. Now, we know that's so far wrong, it's almost hilarious. This, this is a diagram, uh, this is a generalized diagram of a cell. The simplest living cells look exactly like this. And I want to tell you, if any one of these parts doesn't work, the whole thing will die. This is more complicated than any factory we have ever made. It is thousands of times more complicated than this building is. This building does lots of wonderful things. It has air conditioning and heating and lighting and sound systems and all that. But guess what? The living cell has all the equivalent things to that, but it goes and gets its own food. It generates its own energy. It cleans out its own waste. If it gets broken, it repairs itself. And also, by the way, it can duplicate itself. I want to see the auto, the, the car factory that gets its own materials, handles its own waste, generates its own power, and then can also replicate itself into new car producing factories. <laughs> and I want to tell you, by the way, also it can fix itself if it gets broken. That's the simplest living cell can do all those things. The simplest one. And if it can't, guess what? It doesn't get to pass on its DNA to the next generation. The whole idea of evolution is that natural selection sort of steers it so that like the things that help the cell get preserved and the things that don't help it get cast aside. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to procreate first. This is ground zero. If you can't get here, you can't even get started. There's, it doesn't get any simpler than this. This is the most simple it gets. All right, I'm sorry. I'm just... All right. Mycoplasma genitalium is the smallest genome of any living thing that we know of. Uh, it has 482 genes in it. <laughs> and that's the simplest. It doesn't get any simpler. Scientifically, let's have some fun with probability. You didn't think you'd ever hear that phrase, especially in church? Here it is. I'm going to do it really quick. I promise. It was more complicated before. This is the simple version. If if not, you take a nap for just about 30 seconds. We'll get back to you. I'm going to talk about hummingbirds next. That'll be fun. Just wait for that. Don't leave. All right. Fun with probability. Some of you math people are going to love this. I put it in here for you. Scientifically speaking, 1 in 10 to the minus 50 is scientifically considered never. Now, what that is, that's a a 0.0000000050 times 0001. That percent chance. That's 10 to the minus 50. Scientifically, you're allowed to call that never. I didn't actually know that. I just learned that this week. That's never. Okay. If we were flipping a coin, if I had a quarter here and I'm flipping a coin, what are my odds I'm going to get heads? 50-50, right? What are the odds that I can get heads 10 times in a row? One in 1,024. So if, if I did that 1,024 times, the odds are at least once... I'll get heads 10 times in a row. Now, that's a lot of coin flipping, right? But what are the odds that I could flip heads 100 times in a row? 
Who wants to guess? <laughs> never. We got one guess at never. Never is actually basically right. The answer is 1 in 10 to the minus 30. 1 in 10 to the minus 30. That's 30 zeros before we get to our first one, right? That's the odds of it. Now, that is an incomprehensibly large number. 10 to the minus 30 means that if you flipped a quarter every single second for a billion years, you would statistically still not hit that number. In fact, you wouldn't even be close. If you had a computer running a simulation, flipping it a thousand times a second and ran it for four billion years, the odds are you still wouldn't get a hundred heads in a row. That's how big of a number 10 to the minus 30 is. But I'm not done. Wait, there's more. <laughs> what if we wanted to get heads a thousand times in a row? Right, I'm not going to torture you. It's 10 to the minus 294. Now, let's bring it home. What are the odds that we could just get one protein? 10 to the minus 191, and to get one living cell means that's 1 times 10 to the minus 40,000. Can we just say never and just agree that that's okay? All right, if you don't like any of that, here's this. You just got to imagine a tornado going through a junkyard. Those of you that I just lost on quarters, I'm going to try to get you back. <laughs> imagine a tornado goes through a junkyard. What do you think the odds are that it assembles a Boeing 747 ready for takeoff? <laughs> Fueled and ready to go. <laughs> Actually better than 10 to the minus 40,000. Better. Because the airplane can't heal itself or procreate. Okay. <laughs> there you go, people. Irreducible complexity. If it's any simpler than that, it cannot live. All right, I promised you hummingbirds, right? Let's talk about hummingbirds. The wonder of hummingbirds, and then we're going to be done with Secure this morning. The wonder of hummingbirds. I love hummingbirds. I love them. Uh, my wife's got a feeder out on the back deck, and one of my favorite things to do, I've been doing more and more of it as I can, as the weather's been nice, uh, I'll go out the first thing in the morning, if I can beat the kids up, I'll go out there with my cup of coffee, and I'll sit there, and I stay really still, and the, sometimes the quail will come through, and I love quail, but the hummingbirds just fascinate me. They come, and they'll dogfight each other, and they zoom all around the feeder, I just love to watch them do it. It's just one of my favorite things to do in the mornings, watch the hummingbirds go for it. Do you know how fast a hummingbird's wings beat? I had to look this up. They beat at 50 to 80 beats a second. <laughs> Give it a shot. See how many you can do in one second. 50 to 80 beats a second. They can hover. They can fly backwards. They can go sideways. And they can do it all at 55 miles an hour. Their wings beat in this incredible sort of figure eight pattern where as they hit the downstroke, they really literally rotate over upside down and then they come back the other way and then flip back up. And that's what gives them this incredible just aerodynamic control that lets them do all these things at 55 miles an hour. If you scale this up to human size in order for you to do this, the amount of energy they burn in those little tiny bodies, for you to burn that much energy, you'd have to get the calorie equivalent of eating 1,300 hamburgers every day. You'd have to eat 1,300 hamburgers a day and drink 15.8 gallons of water. That's what they do. Just scale down. If you tried to do that, your energy level, your heart would have to beat 1,260 times a minute. Your body temperature would rise to 725 degrees Fahrenheit and you would burst into flames. And we just put some sugar water out for these things and watch them come. <laughs> Hummingbirds are awesome. You could pick almost any living thing and do that. Life is incredible. Amen? And I want to tell you this morning, when we say, is God the creator of life or is it an accident? It is a secure thing to believe that God is the creator of life. It's a secure thing to believe that. Because it really is true. There's just no other explanation for how we have living things everywhere. So safe. What does it keep us safe from to believe this? And I got to really hustle here. Safe. It keeps us safe from the trap of evolution. Now, of course, as we discuss, little e evolution, everybody believes in. Small changes over time. We observe that. That's a scientific fact. 
But big E evolution, the idea of molecules to man evolution, is, uh, is a trap. It's a trap. The devil has laid this trap for people to buy into, to try to escape the accountability that comes. Like if something belongs to somebody else, if they gave it to you, then there's some accountability that comes along with that. And in an effort to avoid that accountability, people have fallen into this trap, but, it, but it's so harmful. Not just because we're not believing the Bible, although that, but belief in evolution leads to some incredibly terrible thing. Most people don't realize that, you know, the origin of um, racism is relatively modern. We're going to get to racism um, in a later message when we talk about being made in the image of God. But I want to just say this just briefly, if I could, that people have taken slaves uh, forever. As far back as you go in history, one people group enslaving another people group, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Slavery is an awful and terrible institution. It's always been bad. But the idea of attaching superiority to that, that we enslaved you not just because we conquered you, but because we're better than you, is a modern idea. And it has its roots directly in the idea of evolution. Because if you believe in evolution, it's not a very far jump to say, well, some people are just more evolved than others. Right? If there's a spectrum between amoebas and fish and lizards and monkeys and people, why not? Why can't that spectrum extend into people. And it, you go read the writings, you go, you go look at the development of the idea of superior and inferior races, and it is directly tied into Darwin's ideas. This is where it comes from. It's not, slavery doesn't come from here, but the idea of superior races comes right from here. Evolution is a terrible trap. It leads to some of the worst wholesale slaughter and murder and just the devaluation of life. If you are just a chemistry accident, sky's the limit on what kind of wickedness. 1 Corinthians 1, 19 is a verse God used to change my life. 1 Corinthians 1 is a very important verse uh, in my life. Um, I grew up in the church. I grew up, um, my parents loved the Lord and they lived out their faith. There was never any doubt in my mind that God was real. I watched God change my parents. I had a front row seat to my parents growing to become more and more like Jesus all the time. They, they'd do everything right. Sometimes they'd sit my sister and I down and say, hey, we messed this up. We just learned this in our Bible study. We're going to change things at our home. You know, I didn't know that was weird until I was older, you know. And so, so I grew up with that. I went away to college unprepared or not prepared well enough. It's not my parents' fault. It just, we thought I was going to a Christian school. I was just unready for the attack on my faith that was going to come. And, and it came from really smart people, from really smart people. And I was kind of intoxicated by that for a while, very impressed by how smart these people were. God used this passage in 1 Corinthians to really deliver me from being impressed by smart people. I don't know if you're still really dazzled by smart people, but you shouldn't be. Darwin, Darwin was a brilliant man. I'm not here to just bash on Darwin. He was a brilliant guy. Um, his sister tragically died, got a disease, got sick. He was a church-going guy. They prayed for her, and she died anyway. And he got heartbroken on a boat and went for a sail around the world. And those writings from his time aboard the Beagle laid the foundation for what he would later develop into a theory of evolution about why the world is so hot terrible and broken and sad without needing God to explain it. He was a smart guy, but I want to tell you, he was a hurting guy. He was a deeply wounded guy who was trying to make sense of things without God. Every smart person you know is also a deeply hurting person. Things have gone wrong in their life and they're trying to make sense of it. It is a trap to try to make sense of these things without God. I used the example last week of going into an art museum and saying, look at that, there was an explosion at the paint factory and it spattered all this artwork. Isn't that incredible? Trying to make sense of the art as an accident, you're never going to get anywhere. 1 Corinthians 1.19 is there in your outline. For it is written, 
I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For that after in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God used this verse to literally change the course of my life, these verses, the whole chapter. Because he says, because God says, where is the wise and the scribe? Listen, all their wisdom has led to utter foolishness. They're so smart, they can believe all that artwork was done by an accident. <laughs> all their wisdom led them to foolishness. I had some of the smartest people I've ever known, professors in college, with a straight face tell me they were unsure if they existed. If you are so smart that you are no longer sure if you exist, something has gone really, really wrong. I had one professor, 100% true story. He said, well, I know that I exist. It's just the rest of you I'm not sure about. <laughs> and he was kind of kidding, but also not. If you've taken philosophy, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a trap. But if you believe in the Bible, you, have, you are safe from that trap. Secondly, you are safe from the destruction of meaninglessness. The big problem here with evolution is not just that it's kind of a crazy idea that's really anti-science. It's anti-scientific to believe in such incredible probabilities and accidents could produce such order. The problem is that it leads to the destruction of meaninglessness. Listen, in lots of ways, the world is better than it's ever been. We're healthier than we've ever been. We're living longer we have access to better food. We have access to better medicine. We have better transportation. Um, we live lives that are astronomically more comfortable than human beings have ever lived. I mean, not just in America, but all over the world, it's true. Lots of, lots of ways the world has gotten just measurably way, way better. And suicide rates in the West and in America are skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. We are living through a plague of people killing themselves. Young people. The number of young people just over the last 10 years has almost doubled that kill themselves in America every single year. Why? If things are so much better, why this? It's because of meaninglessness. We have taught several generations now that they are chemistry accidents and that when they die, that's it. So why suffer before it ends, rather than just have it end. Meaninglessness will destroy you. Ecclesiastes is a depressing, depressing book. I recommend not reading it. <laughs> you all know where to put that. Just say amen. Okay. Ecclesiastes 2, Solomon wrote this. This is just for me. You need to understand about Ecclesiastes. It's written from a human perspective until the very end. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 2.16 says, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? <laughs> Boy, thanks for that. What's he saying? He's saying, what's the point? You do all this stuff and in a couple generations they don't remember anyway. All the stuff you can build and do, it all gets just broken and worn down anyway. And guess what? You know what happens to the wise man and what happens to the fool? They both die. Isn't that a cheerful thought? <laughs> Be as smart as you want to. Guess what? You're going to die. <laughs> Some of those stupid people are going to outlive you. <laughs> Maybe take your stuff when you're gone. He, he says that, I'm paraphrasing, but he says that. He says, what if you're a really wise man, your kid's stupid and takes all your stuff, what then? That's a paraphrase, you go read it, it's in there. And then he's, look at what he says, his conclusion of this. And when he realizes that everybody's going to die and it's all going to get forgotten and it's all going to go away anyway, he says, therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. He says, I hated life because it's all for nothing anyway. It's all for nothing, so why am I working so hard for nothing? If I work so hard, I can build things that will be destroyed. I can do things that nobody will remember. And as a prize, I get to die just like the stupid guy. Okay. 
the destruction of meaninglessness. If there's no meaning, he's exactly right. This is true if there's no meaning. But there is meaning. Because life is not an accident. Life is a gift of God. Concluding the message this morning with sound. No charge for these extra minutes of preaching. 100% free. Sound. You can build your life on this because God is the giver of life. God is the giver of it. He is the author of it. Life comes from somewhere. It does not come from biology. The video that we saw at the beginning of the message is, is, is right. You can have a body with all the parts, all the biology is there, and it can be dead in a doornail. We can have a body with all the right parts put together and we still can't put life into it, let alone create it from scratch. I mean, just like, what, what's, what's changed biologically from the second something's alive to the second after it's dead? The change is not biological. I mean, stuff stops moving, although everything doesn't stop all at once either. Sometimes it takes quite a while for some of the processes to really actually grind all the way to a halt. So what is it that makes it stop? Something's departed. What is it? Life. Where did it come from? Not from the DNA. It came from God. God is the giver of it. You have something inside of you that's more than your biology. You have something inside of you that's more than chemistry. What that thing inside of you is, is it, it's, it drives the biology. It propels the chemistry forward. And that thing is life. You have a spark inside of you that was placed there by the living God. Psalms 139, 14, the Bible says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Everything may not be right with you in your life, but you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not an accident. God put you together. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Not only does God give life, but God is the giver of eternal life. In John 3.16, most famous verse in the Bible for very good reason, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's the giver of life. The life that you have right now, that spark that's inside of you, but God wants you to have more than just that. God wants you to have eternal life. And it is available not for those who are good. It's available for those who believe. And because God gives life, God also gives meaning and purpose to life. Do not try to live life without purpose and meaning. Life is supposed to have meaning. It's supposed to have purpose. It has value because God gave it. Whether you think it's got purpose or meaning or not, your life has value. Every life is precious and valuable because it is the divine spark, the gift of God inside every living thing. Every life has value. The question is not that. That is not up for debate. That is a fact that life has value. The question this morning I want to ask you is, does your life have meaning? Is there a purpose for it? What are you living for? I know you're living, but what for? Ephesians 2, 10 and 19. Let's read it. Make two comments and we'll close in prayer. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has ordained some things for you to do. God has a plan. He didn't make you and just be like, oh yeah, let's, let's find something for Josh to do. We've got to keep him off the streets. <laughs> There's some good things. Good things that God wants you to do and me. And he created us for that. When God made Adam, he didn't just make him to be on vacation. 
We're going to get there in two weeks. He put him in a garden, gave him a work to do. He said, take care of these animals. Take care of these plants. Tend this garden. God gave him work to do. Purpose. And God has purpose for you too. And then it also says this. Now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made nigh, are made close by the blood of Christ. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. I'd like to say this, this morning before we close, one of God's purposes for your life, now, God has different things for each and every single one of you. Every one of you is an individual and unique, and God has something just for you. But God has something that's for all of you also, and that is this. One of the purposes of your life is to be close to God. Jesus Christ shed his blood on an old rugged cross for this reason, that you who were far could instead be close. That you who were orphans and strangers could instead become fellow citizens and part of his family. One of God's purposes for your life is that you would be close to him and part of his family. You will never have the meaning and purpose in your life that you are looking for, that you need to have, that God wants you to have until you are close to him and part of his family. If you ever hit a bow and I'd close, and Lorene, if you're able to come and just play, and uh, I know I'm slightly over here uh, this morning, but I want to invite you before we leave, and some have to go and begin preparing things, but for those of you who don't, I want to ask you if I could, please, before you leave, before we get busy with everything else that has to happen today, Take a moment now of quietness, just you and God, to do a little bit of business with Him. We're not going to do an altar call. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or do anything like that. This is genuinely true. This time, right now, no tricks. This is just you and just God. Is God trying to say something to you this morning? What is it? I believe that God wanted to speak to you. I believe that's why you came to church. If you didn't want to hear from God, I, I think you would have stayed home. Please don't leave here without knowing what it was that God wanted to speak to your heart about personally. Now, I, I, I've preached to this whole room. There's, there's more people here than I could speak to individually even if I wanted to. But now's your time with you and the Lord. What's God saying to you? Maybe you're here this morning and the questions of security are prominent in your mind. You've been worn down by just the weight of the smart people who say that believing the Bible is foolishness. That it's backwards and it's ignorant. And maybe your heart has just trembled a little bit about being unsure if you can really stake it all on believing the Bible. Now, I've tried to give you some evidence this morning, but more than even just evidence, what you need is a word from the Lord. Say, God, is it really okay if I just trust you on this? Can I really be secure in just believing your word? Maybe God needs to speak to your heart about that this morning. Maybe it's some kind of a trap that the devil's laid for you and you'd say, you know, I've got one foot in this trap already. Maybe it's with the meaninglessness. And you said, I just don't even know what it's all for. It seems like it's all such a waste. It seems like it all ends bad. It all turns to dust and ash anyway. What is the point of trying? And you don't just need